for us to play a leading role in developing this burgeoning field, interdisciplinary field of animal studies, and thinking about ways to be empirically and intellect intellectually rigorous about animal issues while also fostering connections to animal advocacy. Now, just to be specific about some of the things that we do to, to um, flesh it out. So the Cornerstone really is an undergraduate minor. We offer, some of the courses that we offer recently have been animal minds, animal policy, keeping animals, food animals, the environment, ethics in animals, and we attract students from all over the place, biology, fish, psychology, anthropology. It's really been great. And we also do other things to try to engage the undergraduates, such as screenings of movies. Recently we had one Cowspiracy with some panelists discussing the movie and opening up the conversation there. So that, that's really kind of the core day-to-day -day of, of what we're up to. But we're also doing a lot more, more broadly supported research and teaching. We've offered course development grants internally to NYU professors that want to develop courses in animal studies. And um, we also have created travel grants and other kinds of research grants for graduate students, for instance, to fund people going to the Miami Animals Conference. And probably the best thing we do at the money is Nicola DeLong is going to introduce the panel. We're able to hire an assistant professor, faculty fellow, to do a lot of the teaching and undergraduate engagement and advising of the minor. We also do a lot of public events like this one, but I'll also just tell you some of them that we did last year to give you an idea. We had an event called Performing Species, another one called Animals in Film, in which we invited the director, Darren Ar Aronofsky, to talk about these issues. We, we had a conference called Digital Animals and Fashion and Animals, Anatomy of Fatal Attraction. And we also host then internally within NYU more what you might consider serious scholarly disciplinary workshops. These can be half-day or all-day workshops where within history or political science or philosophy, we bring in a scholar, really talk about a paper that they're working on, and this is really sort of to try to assess the state of the field of animal studies within particular disciplines that we're trying to expand it into. And then also, finally, we, we uh, have been doing conferences and other events to engage with other animal study scholars across the university, so we foster conferences in collaboration with Columbia, with New School, and other places. And so, lastly, I'll just tell you a little bit briefly about some upcoming events that we have on October 29th. We have Congressman Earl Blumenauer from Oregon talking about how to try to engage animal advocacy issues within the realms of public policy and politics. And in the spring, we've got a couple of events, vegan athletes and seeing seafood as animals. So if you're interested and you don't know about us already, you can easily just find us on the website, get on our emailing list, or talk to Nicola. So now I'm just going to invite Nicola DeLong, who is the assistant professor faculty fellow, teaches a lot of our courses in animal studies, advises all of the minors, and does the heavy lifting of organizing events like this as well. And I'll introduce the panel. Uh, welcome everyone, so it seems we don't have too many people standing in the back, so that's great. But thanks for filling your room. Uh, if there's any free seats, uh, raise your hand, so people can eat, sit, work, and you. Um, so thanks for the great turnout. Um, I also apologize for my maybe rude email concerning the way that you stay. <laughs> Lack of a guarantee to get a seat in the room, but, you know, fire card policy, safety, and so on and so forth. Um, so, um, so I'm really excited about this event. Uh, so, well, obviously the, the idea of having an event with around 50 batteries and animals is not mine, but uh, when I suggested the idea to my colleagues last semester, um, everybody got excited and we are really pleased to have such an impressive panel of speakers. Um, it's actually one of the first events of this type in an academic setting, um, so we're really, really excited. Um, I don't need to say much about effective altruism in animals uh, because they are going to do it. But let me first introduce our speakers and how they are going to proceed. So, um, Pierre Singer is going to first part, and then John will be talking, and then both uh, Marion and Jasmine will alternate. Yes, I have to present their own work and a few of us. So, um, Peter Singer uh, may not need uh, an introduction, but deserves it. Um, so, uh, so Peter Singer is an IRA LDD CAM professor of biotics uh, at the University Center for Human Values at Princeton. He's also a Laurent professor at the University of Melbourne in Australia. He's most well known for his classics, animal liberation, practical ethics, 
the expanding circle, uh, the life you can save, and most recently, the point of view with, of the universe, co-authored with uh, Katarzyna de la Zarek and uh, the most good you can do, which will be at the center of today's discussions. Um, John Buckman is the executive director of ACE, Animal Charity Evaluators, which is going to present to you today. Uh, before uh, working at uh, ACE, uh, John has held diverse leadership positions in um, animal advocacy groups um, in the past decade, including as a director at a shelter and wildlife rehabilitation center, a human investigator, and as a founder of um, 501c3 for animal advocacy group. Um, at AAC today, John works to identify the most impactful ways to help animals through research, evaluations, in data driven analysis. Um, Jasmine Singer, who uh, I think it is not related to uh, Peter, uh, <laughs> is the executive director of our hen house, uh, podcast many of you must know um, about animals. She's a writer and activist living in New York City. In addition to her work for our hen house, she, uh, which she founded in January 2010, she has a book forthcoming on food and activism entitled Always Too Much, Never Enough, and Never Enough, which will be published by Penguin Random House in print uh, in February 2016. Um, Marianne Sullivan, program director of our pen house, um, is a lawyer and an adjunct professor of animal law at Columbia Law School. Uh, she's the co-host of Hen House and of the recent Animal Law Podcast. Um, she has served as chair of both the Animal Law Committee of the New York City Bar Association and the American Bar Association's TIPS section's Animal Law Committee. Uh, she has taught Animal Law and Farm Animal Law at a number of law schools, including NYU Law School. And among her publications is a trilogy of essays for authored with David Watson on Farm Animals and the Law. Uh, uh, so, without further ado, um, please um, give a first round of applause to our speakers and let's listen to Every speaker is going to give a 10 15 minute speech, and then the four of them will discuss together, and then we'll open the floor for QA for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the first question is, I'm not sure quite where I should speak from. Um, there, there's obviously these columns that are disadvantaging some, so there's immediately a question of justice. So I back and forward, so I disadvantage more people but less each one of you. Uh, Alright, so I want to talk a bit about uh, effective algorithm as the sort of framework of this uh, event. Uh, and uh, then I'll say a little bit about how it may relate to animals more specifically. Um, so effective altruism uh, is a term that uh, I think some of you will have heard of and, and some of you will not have heard of. Uh, essentially, it's a, you could say, a philosophy in the popular sense of a philosophy of life, a way of living, um, and it's also an emerging movement of people who are becoming involved in it. Uh, as a philosophy, the idea is that uh, you should do things to make the world a better place. Um, that's the altruism part. You should be thinking of others and how to make uh, life, life better for others. Uh, but the, the effective part of it is you should be using your capacities to analyze evidence and to reason about the evidence that you've got in order to have the biggest possible impact in making the world a better place. In other words, as the title of my recent book suggests, it's not just that you should make the world a better place, you should do the most good you can. That doesn't necessarily mean that you should live like a saint all the time, but insofar as you're putting resources, time, skills, money, whatever it might be, into um, making the world a better place, you should try to see that those resources are used as effectively as they possibly can be. So that's the idea in a very broad, abstract way. 
Um, the next question that you have to then raise is, well, what do you mean by making the world a better place? Uh, so there are clearly some, some questions of value that come up at that point. Um, and I think effective altruists would agree on some values, although not all of them, because it's not a movement that has a single organization um, that governs it, so there's no, uh, there's no creed you have to subscribe to or party line that you have to follow, otherwise you get your membership ticket taken away. Um, so uh, I'd say something that pretty much everybody would subscribe to is that it's really about making the world a better place. Uh, that is, it's global in its concerns. It's not just about making your local community a better place or about making the United States a better place. I mean, which is not to say that things you do for your local community or the United States may not, uh, not say that they don't count, but in trying to do the most good you can, that's where, that's the standard that they would have to come up against. So it would only be if the most good I can do is by acting in my local community or is by acting uh, nationally. Uh, I can do more good that way than by acting globally, then okay, fine. But it's a global standard. It's a standard of doing the most good for the world as a whole. And in terms of good, um, I think probably most effective altruists would see this in pretty concrete terms relating to well-being or welfare. In other words, sort of familiar ideas of making those whose lives we can change uh, better, reducing the amount of suffering that uh, is in the world, perhaps the amount of suffering that those we, whose lives we can affect are experiencing, or um, adding to their happiness, well-being, welfare, if we can do that. Now that's uh, not to say that there aren't other values. Um, certainly uh, there would be some effective altruists who would think that things like justice and equality and fairness uh, are important. Um, in fact, I guess probably all effective altruists would think they're important in some way, but only some of them would think that they're intrinsically important. That is that if you can increase the amount of justice or equality in the world, you ought to do so even if it doesn't make anyone better off, or even if on balance it doesn't make anyone better off. Um, so some effective altruists might think that, but I, most of the ones that I seem to rub up against seem to think that, um, well, those things are valuable instrumentally. They're valuable because the world will be actually happier less suffering if, in fact, it is also more just, more equal, more fair. Um, so that's uh, then another value that I haven't mentioned, I guess, is um, uh, preventing premature death. Um, that's also something which I guess typically effective altruists would think is a good thing. So, for example, when they're talking about helping people in extreme poverty, saving the lives of children who are dying from preventable diseases would be seen as a good thing. Um, and uh, you might say, well, it's seen as a good thing because it reduces suffering and allows them to live good lives. It might be seen as a good thing independently as well. So, so I think the core values are, are sort of welfare values, but there are certainly other values that uh, would be considered by, by a number of them. Um, then the question that obviously is very relevant for this discussion is, well, what do we mean by the others who are affected by our actions? Um, are we restricting this to human beings or are we including all sentient beings? And I'm very pleased to be able to say that I think there is a, pretty much a, a universal consensus in the movement that it's not restricted to human beings. That the suffering, the welfare of non-human animals also matters, also counts. Now, how much does it count? That's a question where you might have some disagreement going on. Um, I think, I mean, it's, in thinking about how much does it count, there's, there's two ways of, of looking at that question. 
One would be a sort of general philosophical sense of do human interests count more because they're human interests, because they're not the interests of animals. And I think, again, it would be pretty good, pretty close to a consensus in the effective altruism movement that that is not the case. <coughs> human interests don't count more just because they're the interests of our species. That would be a bit like saying the interests of Americans count more because they're our co-nationals, compatriots, whatever term you want to use. And I don't think that's a view that effective altruists would defend. But they might defend the view that the capacities for both suffering and enjoying life of normal human beings are significantly greater than those of non-human animals. And if they think that, then they might think it's reasonable to focus on promoting the interests of human beings ahead of promoting the interests of non-human animals uh, because you know, the, the, the nature of their suffering means that if we can reduce their suffering uh, that would be right, better than reducing the suffering of, let's say, one non-human animal and maybe better than reducing the suffering of quite a large number of non-human animals. So that's clearly a question that we're going to have to discuss uh, today. Um, I think that's, that's a, a critical issue. And that's one where, as I say, I don't think there is any real agreement and there hasn't even really been enough discussion, I think, in the effective altruist movement as yet. Um, but uh, uh, it's something that, as I say, we, we need to talk about. Um, but certainly there's quite a few effective altruists who do think that animal interests are very important and that, in fact, that ought to be a priority, um, that uh, working to reduce animal suffering uh, ought to be a priority, perhaps because they think, uh, and I imagine John will talk more about this soon, perhaps because they think we can do it we can use our resources more effectively. We can make a bigger impact on the total sum of, uh, of suffering in the world, if you like, uh, by focusing on uh, the suffering of animals and trying to stop that than we can with uh, focusing on humans. Um, so those are the kinds of questions that uh, we need to talk about. Um, one other thing that I think is important to say here is that if you can have an impact in reducing the suffering of uh, non-human animals and humans together, then clearly you have an extra kind of bonus. Um, and I think there's a, a good case for saying that you can do that. And for example, that you can do that by trying to reduce the consumption of animals. Um, if you reduce the consumption of animals, then you reduce the amount of suffering in factory farms in particular, or in animal commercial animal livestock raising in general, um, and that's a huge source of suffering. Plus, um, you reduce the contribution to climate change that uh, uh, livestock production makes, um, and that's some debate about how great that is, but um, uh, it was stated by the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization a few years ago, uh, United Nations Organization, that uh, livestock industry has a greater contribution to climate change than the entire transport sector. And all of the cars, buses, trucks, trains, aeroplanes, ships, whatever. So, um, and, and that's, some people think that it's the lowest. So, uh, in any case, that would be a good argument whichever way you're going to go um, on this question. So, um, I don't want to go on um, too long, we've got uh, great other speakers. Uh, let me just say, I think that um, uh, the methods of effective altruism um, are really important. I think the idea that when we give to a charity, we should be asking tough questions about what impact will our donation have? And is the charity really providing us with information by which we can assess that. I think that that's really important. I mean, I know effective altruism has its critics. We may be hearing a bit of that today, uh, but certainly uh, some of the reviews that have come out of uh, my book and the most good you can do, and have come out just recently of a, 
book by Will McCaskill, who's an, uh, an effective altruist in England, uh, which is called Doing Good Better. Uh, if you look at reviews of that, some of them are basically saying, well, this is too mathematical, this is too calculating, this is too coldly rational, uh, even this is too utilitarian, as if that were a term of <laughs> Uh, and they, they, they're basically saying we're, we're taking the, the heart out of, um, out of altruism, out of charity, out of uh, philanthropy. Um, well, I don't think so. I think that what we are doing is we are adding the head. Um, we're not trying to stop people having uh, uh, emotional, uh, empathetic grounds, for example, for trying to uh, reduce suffering. But we're just saying if that is what you're trying to do, if you care about the suffering of animals, for instance, or about the suffering of humans, don't you want to reduce the suffering of more animals, save more animals from suffering, rather than saving fewer animals from suffering? And if that is what you want to do, then you're going to have to find some evidence about whether giving to some charities rather than to other charities um, does more good. And uh, I think it's, it's clear that you can do more good in, in some areas. Let me just mention one example from the animal movement. Um, because people give on an emotional basis, if you look at the number of animals suffering in different areas, different sectors, and you compare that with the amount of dollars that flow to organizations that are working on different sectors, you find that the largest number of dollars are going to organizations that are helping companion animals, basically dogs and cats. But if you look at the number of animals who are suffering, you have this huge disproportion that the number of animals who are suffering are farmed animals, animals that are being raised for food. And so I think one of the things that effective altruism can do here is to get people to think about how your donations will do the most good for animals um, and to ask questions about, well, um, why am I giving to dogs and cats? Say, is it because I love dogs and cats? Um, well, but what about pigs and cows and chickens? Don't you care about their suffering as well? And so I think one thing that effective altruism can do is point people in those directions uh, to ask about those impacts. But I also think that it can have an, an, an effect on the charities themselves and basically ask them to think about how they know that what they're doing is the best thing that they could be doing with the resources that they have available. And then, if we can get that information, we can try to guide people in the direction of having the biggest thing. So, thanks very much. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very honored to be up here with such distinguished speakers. 
and, uh, and I'm very happy to be here speaking on all, all of you here today. So as mentioned earlier, I'm John Bachman. I'm the Executive Director of Animal Charity Evaluators. We're a nonprofit that works to find and promote the best ways to help animals. The ways we do that are through things such as evaluating tactics that are commonly used by animal groups, through evaluating animal charities themselves, and through providing advice to the advocacy community on how they can be most effective in helping animals. So when thinking about animal advocacy and an effective altruism mindset, one of the first questions you should ask yourself is which cause area should I focus on? Now Peter Singer just alluded to this in his recent uh, talk, but there are many different areas where animals need our help. In fact, there are billions and billions of animals in the world that need our help from animals in the wild, animals used in entertainment, animals used for food, and companion animals, and of course, animals used in research and entertainment. So how do we decide which of those areas that we should focus on? Well, I've actually spent the last decade working on that myself. In fact, I've worked personally in four out of those five cause areas. And one of the things I tried to do when I, I got out of college and I wanted to help animals is I just, I tried to get out there and do whatever I could. We wanted to do something, right? Because you know there's so many animals out there that need our help and we want to do something to help them. So you, you get out there, you do whatever's immediately apparent to you. You go volunteer at your local shelter. You, I worked in wildlife rehabilitation. You go, uh, you give talks at colleges. You do anything you can. But along the way, you start asking yourself, am I really being as impactful as I could be with the same amount of time and energy that I'm putting into it. And if you're asking yourself that question, then you probably can be a lot more impactful with your work. When we're asking ourselves which of these cause areas we should focus on, there are three things that we consider. One, what is the scale of the problem? So how big is it? Two, what level of neglect is there surrounding that issue? So how much attention is being paid to that issue? And three, how tractable is the solution to that problem. Let's take a look at these individually. In terms of scale, we have over 7 billion humans on the planet. We have over 33 billion farm animals at any one point, and that's just land animals, mind you. We have 33 billion land animals raised in farms at any given time, and we have somewhere between 100 billion and 1 trillion animals in the wild. Now, why is there such a wide variance in that last category? Well, that's because there are a lot of species that their method of surviving in the wild is to give birth to very large numbers of offspring, from dozens to hundreds of offspring at a single time. The majority of those offspring are going to die likely painful deaths, either through starvation, predation, illness, and things of that nature. But as long as a couple of them survive, the species still does okay. Now, that method of reproducing has its benefits in that that species perseveres, but the thing we should care about is that there's a very large number of animals that are suffering in that area. The next largest categories, after the ones you see up here, would be companion animals, of which there are about one billion in the world. But do we really want to focus on companion animals when the majority of those are cared for well in, in homes? I think that's an important consideration to make, is how deep is the suffering that we're, we're talking about. And after that, the next highest category would be animals used in research, and that number is somewhere around 100 million. So clearly, in terms of scale, we should be focusing on either animals used in farms or wild animals. So how do we, we decide which of those areas we should prioritize? Well, let's look at some of the other factors. In terms of neglect, in both 2013 and 2014, only 3% of donations to charities in the United States went to either animal charities or environmental charities. The slice of the pie is so small that they weren't even given their own space. So with that in mind, for convenience, let's say that animals receive 1.5% of total donations to charities in the United States. As, again, Peter Singer alluded to in his previous talk, if we look at the donations that go to animal charities, we find that less than 1% go to charities that specifically work on farm animal issues. And this is despite the fact that 99 out of every 100 animals in the United States 
that are killed are killed for food. Now this is clearly an area of neglect. Now, this doesn't solve the dilemma of whether or not we focus on animals in the wild or animals that use for food, right? Because, of course, there's a lot of wild animals out there that need our help as well. Let's look at the last factor, tractability. And this is where we are able to make our decision. While there's certainly large amounts of suffering in the wild, and we should care about that, we don't have a great approach to how we can combat that suffering at this point in time. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't be thinking about it, and we shouldn't be asking ourselves if there's ways to do it, and we're happy that there are people out there doing it. But if you look at the other cause area, animals used for, farm, for food, it's clear that there are ways that we can combat that problem through education and creating behavior change, simply not eating the animals, right? So when you look at those three factors, scale, neglect, and tractability, it's clear that we should focus on farm animal advocacy as a high impact area. And that's why our top three recommended charities right now are all farm animal advocacy groups. If you look at our cost effectiveness estimates, for which we have lots of great details on our website, you can find that for a thousand dollar donation, you can spare over 4,700 animals from a lifetime of misery in a factory farm by donation to one of our top charities. Now by comparison, you can only save roughly two and a half animals by donating to a local companion animal shelter. And the reason for this is because direct animal care is very expensive. So a shelter has to pay for food, has to pay for medicine, vaccines, staff time, mortgage for a shelter, duration of stay in a shelter. There's a lot of costs involved with direct animal care, and that makes those areas a lot less efficient. Now, of course, I'm not saying that we don't need any other areas of advocacy for animals besides farm animals, because of course we do. There's animals out there in those cause areas that need our help, and we should dedicate some of our resources to helping them. But when you look at the fact that I just showed you about how much money we are giving to farm animal advocacy in comparison to the scope of the problem, it should be clear that we should be reallocating money to that cause area. If you think about it, when I said that 1.5% of donations go to animal advocacy groups out of our entire pool of donations, and 1% of that goes to farm animal, ad farm animal advocacy groups, that means that 0.015% of donations in the United States are going to combat what is arguably the greatest source of suffering in the world that we can combat. And that is an issue. But again, so I wanted to emphasize, we're not saying that there's no value to those other cause areas, just that we need to reapportion some money to farm animal advocacy. Another thing that's commonly brought up is, what about farm animal sanctuaries? So those are farm animal advocacy groups that focus on helping farm animals by rescue and through uh, direct animal care, again, which as we established, is a very expensive way to help animals. We absolutely think there's value in helping sanctuaries to perform their work in so much as they can provide an important symbol to the world of farm animals in a natural setting, in so much that they can provide tools through education in sanctuary tours, bringing members of the public to experience farm animals directly, through providing photos and videos to other advocacy groups so they have materials they can use in their own education efforts. In those ways, sanctuaries are very valuable. But the danger lies in sanctuaries taking too many resources for direct animal care. So I would just say that it's important to support sanctuaries up to the point where they can provide those educational tools and symbolic value, but we should all be careful and cautious to not focus too much funding into direct animal care. Now I've talked a little bit about ACE recommended charities here, and how did we get to our recommendations? Well, we have seven criteria that we use to come to that conclusion, and I'm going to touch on them really quickly here. First, we look at room for more funding. So it's very important to us that an advocacy group that we look at has a plan in place for how they would spend additional funds to help animals. If they don't have a plan in place, then there's no point in us recommending them and trying to get them more money. We look at cost effectiveness and mission effectiveness. So knowing what we do know about advocacy, we're able to make some cost effectiveness calculations that allow us to compare the effectiveness of different groups 
across different uh, organizations. And also mission effectiveness. So we want to look at what cause area are they focusing on and what programs are they using to address that issue. The next one's really important to us, and that's that the organization has a clear understanding of success and failure. This is because a lot of organizations feel pressure to just continually put output of the numbers of animals that they're helped with X, or the number of the animals that they're helped with Y program. And because of that, they don't spend time and energy and resources evaluating the quality of their work. That is very, very dangerous. Because what can happen in that situation is you can continually invest money in poor programs that are not producing impactful results. So we really value organizations that take the time to evaluate the quality of their programs, that take the time to find which programs are failures. We want groups to fail. If you're not failing, then you're not trying things. You're not, you're not expanding. You're not evolving as an organization. We want groups to have failed and then to have shown us that they reprioritize their funding, that they focus on other program areas, and that they move away from areas that are performing ineffective. Fifth, we look at the organization's track record of success. We also look at things like the organization's leadership structure, they have low rates of turnover, and that they're a transparent organization. Based on these criteria at this point in time, we're happy to mention our top charities are Mercy for Animals, the Humane League, and Animal Equality. So again, these are all farm animal advocacy groups that we feel are doing exceptional work. And we also want to recognize some charities we put in a standout category. These are groups that we feel are doing exceptionally good work, but for one reason or another weren't quite in that highest, highest tier. And that would be the Farm Animal Rights Movement, the Albert Schweitzer Foundation, the HSUS Farm Animal Protection Campaign, and Vegan Outreach. Now, of course, we wouldn't be doing our own due diligence if we weren't applying some of these same criteria and standards to ourselves, so we're trying to measure our impact as an organization as well. I'm very happy to announce in just our first full year of having rigorously researched evaluations and recommendations, we've moved almost a half million dollars to our top charities, despite only having a budget ourselves of $125,000. We're very happy with that, and we intend to continue to improve in that area. <coughs> Lastly, I want to bring up one point that we can all consider in our own advocacy, and that's how we can create bigger change by strategic discussions. So when you're talking to someone about changing their diet or behavior change, a lot of the time, people are not ready to make a, a leap to vegetarianism or a leap to veganism or things of that nature. Sometimes they just want to learn more information or they want to reduce a little bit. So what's the best way to direct those conversations? Well, if we take a look at this information provided in Nick Cooney's book, Veganomics, we see that if you adopt a vegan diet, you are preventing 100% of the days of suffering in a factory farm. It makes sense. But if you're a vegetarian and simply still, er, excuse me, if you're vegan but still eat dairy, you're preventing 99% of the days of suffering in a factory farm. Taking it further down the line, if you're a vegetarian, you're preventing 89% of the days of suffering. And very interestingly, if you simply avoid chicken and fish, you're preventing 84% of the days of the suffering in a factory farm. Now, here's where it becomes even more interesting. If you simply don't eat red meat, you're only preventing 4% of the days of suffering in a factory farm. Now, the reason for this is because it takes over 200 chickens to make up the meat of a single cow. So by eating no beef, you're only affecting a very small number of animals. Whereas if you take out smaller animals like chicken and fish, you end up affecting a much larger number of animals and increase your reduction of suffering with your diet. Now, of course, there's other concerns to be had here because of course, uh, cows can contribute more to environmental issues. So if that's a passionate area for you, that's something you should consider. But in, strictly in terms of animal advocacy and the reduction of suffering with farm animals, you can do a lot of good by taking out the smaller animals. And that's important for us to consider in our conversations. <laughs> Lastly, I want to point everyone to our website, animalcharityevaluators.org. We've got a ton of great content on there. 
We have an incredible team, many of which are here today. We have a new board member, Jeff. We have wonderful interns, Sophia and Leah in the back here. They're doing fantastic work to continue producing high quality content on our website. And please reach out to us, contact us, let us know if there's something you can't find on the website because that's gonna help us get better. We had some people reach out to us with some pretty hefty critiques lately. And we're not, we're not sitting here, we're not, we're not worried about bruising our ego. Okay, we're worried about helping as many animals as possible. And if there's some things that we're doing that we could be doing better, we want to improve. So please, do visit our website. Let us know if you have any issues or questions and comments and critiques, and we really appreciate that. I want to draw attention to two final projects that we're embarking on right now that are really exciting and interesting and relevant for this discussion. One, we are currently hiring an advocacy research program officer. This is a very exciting opportunity where a generous benefactor has provided $1 million to be used over three years exclusively on research to evaluate the effectiveness of tactics to help animals. This is a tremendous opportunity because very little money has been committed to this field in the past, so we're very proud and happy to hire that person through ACE and to work with Analytics and an oversight committee to produce great research to help all animal advocacy groups. So please, if you know someone who that sounds like it might be a good fit for, uh, please do let them know we are accepting applications and we will be through uh, November. And the very last thing I want to bring up is that another exciting initiative we have on the horizon is an academics conference we're going to be holding next year. We haven't decided on the exact location, it's very early in the stages of planning, but the basic idea is we want to take researchers and grad students and professors who care about animals and try and unify that care for animals with the work that they're doing for their education or for their career. Because we feel this is a really missed opportunity here. There's lots of research being done. Why don't we use it in a way to mutually benefit both animal advocates and people's careers in science overall? So if this sounds like something you're interested in, please stay tuned. If you visit our website, animalcharityevaluators.org, right on the homepage, you'll see a sign up for a newsletter. That's a great way to stay informed as that project develops. If you are interested in either speaking or attending it, please feel free to see me or our wonderful intern, Sophia, here. Sophia, if you raise your hand. Uh, so if you could please see one of us afterwards. She is headlining this project, and we would love to hear from you. So thank you so much. which is not to say that we are defending ineffective altruism or attacking the effective altruism movement. In fact, we love the effective altruism movement and are deeply moved by its commitment to a bottom line of reduction of suffering as efficiently as possible. So we're gonna skip the threshold question of why we should work on animal advocacy and specifically farmed animal advocacy as opposed to or along with other high value impact opportunities. I mean, Peter Singer's on the panel and I think he could probably handle any questions on that. He wrote that book. <laughs> what we will do as the sort of outsiders is raise some questions that we have about how it all works and about what some of the risks are in making the decisions about what works to change the world for animals. So just to give you a brief idea of, of where we're coming from, because if you're not familiar with our hen house, it might inform uh, what we're about to talk about right now for you. Our hen house is a nonprofit that Marianne and I started in 2010. Uh, it was after I was the campaigns manager for Farm Sanctuary. And it produces media resources for people who want to change the world for animals with a strong bent on the arts and on advocacy uh, in any way possible. Marianne is also a professor of animal law, and so we have a, a, a strong bent on, on 
the legal world as well with Marianne's new podcast, the Animal Law Podcast, and this weekend is the 300th episode of the Arkin House Weekly Podcast. So, uh, if you're not listening to that, I, I hope you do. Peter has been on, John's going to be on soon, and a few people in the room have been as well. So that's uh, that's a brief glimpse into our hen house. So our first question is: Are animals different? And we don't mean this exactly in the way we're just talking about it. We're to, as Jasmine said, we're going to skip the question of do animals matter and skip the question of should it be farm animals, we're all on board. But animals are different. And at least those who seek to reduce suffering for animals face a significantly different challenge than those who seek to reduce human suffering, especially when you're talking about farmed animals. And it seems to us that that has major implications for how effective altruism works in, in this particular field. I mean, assuming that our goal is to limit suffering, which I think it is, the human realm is relatively easy to figure out how to do it. Uh, almost everyone agrees that physical suffering and even death uh, are bad things. So of course, we could get Peter to talk about the death thing for a few hours, but we'll skip that. Um, figuring out which projects the most, which, which projects stop the most physical suffering and death for the least money is largely a math problem. It's a complicated math problem, but it's a math problem that's doable. The big problem, as I understand it, and uh, that, that seems to be facing effective altruists, is how to get people to give, to help people uh, with problems that don't actually touch the giver's life directly. And persuading people that they should donate to people in regardless of proximity, people in far off lands, people who they're very unfamiliar with, is tougher than doing the math. But it's still, there are a lot of good arguments for why that's the right thing to do. And, that's, that's great. So for, for, for people, uh, it's, it's a very, very compelling movement. We're both, as, as Jasmine said, we're recently introduced to the movement and we're deeply moved by it. But when it comes to animals, our challenges kind of shift a little. Uh, they, they, they start off similarly. The first thing to do is to convince people that animals are out there suffering, that, that suffering that they don't know about. And the next step is, is also kind of similar, is getting them to understand that that's a bad thing. It's probably a little more challenging than it is with human victims, but we're definitely making progress here. I think people are really starting to get on board with the fact that farm animals shouldn't be caused to suffer. Uh, they're not doing a whole lot about it, but they're getting on board with that idea. So we are seeing shifts in that direction. And uh, some people still, uh, as John pointed out, uh, a lot of the money, is, an enormous percentage of the money is still going to cats and dogs. People obviously see that suffering as something that they need to care about. But there are shifts toward farm animals, but it's the ask. It's the ask that starts to differ dramatically. Um, these, the, rather than asking people to give their money differently, as, as effective altruists are doing in, in the human realm, we also have to persuade them that they have to step out of their life, they have to do something that goes completely against the mainstream, and they have to um, uh, stop actively causing and paying for the suffering that they're bothered by. That's a much bigger ask and a much more complicated problem, I think. So animals are different. Um, an enormous reason that, uh, that an the reducing animal suffering is different than you reducing human suffering is that most of the people you're going to be appealing to are actually contributing. Actually sort of consciously. They kind of know it. So you have a big lift when you're trying to change the world there. Figuring out what's the most effective way of changing these hearts and minds is challenging. And it's not definitely not just a math problem, such as how many mosquito nets prevent how much malaria. Uh, even people who are actually aware of suffering and who are driven by the need to, to end it um, might be far behind the curve on this issue. I, Peter mentioned that most people in the effective altruism movement accept that animals uh, do matter and that animal suffering does matter, and yet a, a, a lot blog entry on, on ACE points out that um, I think a third of effective altruists are vegan or vegetarian, which is an enormous number when you look at the rest of the world. But like, what about the other two thirds? These are people who care about suffering and who understand that animals matter. Like, why are they vegan? You know, you gotta ask. Do they think there's something better than veganism to, to help animals or do even these people who are committed to reducing suffering fail to recognize that their first obligation here is to stop causing it. All right, Jasmine. <laughs> we're, we're, we're tag teaming because we're completely codependent. <laughs> okay, thank you. Point two, everyone needs to step up to the plate. 
So, to say the least, our task is a large one. We all know that. We need to change the way consumers consume. We need to change the way people eat. Diet is one of the most intractable habits that people have. We need to change the way people think in very fundamental ways. The changes we are seeking to make are, without question, monumental. So, we need everyone who cares to spread the word, or as many as possible. We're not going to achieve this goal with top-down organizational campaigns from animal rights organizations, with corporate outreach, or even with the development of new cruelty-free foods, though these are all enormously important. But we need boots on the ground, lots of them. We need every single person who is awakened to this issue to spread the word. We need this to go viral. We are, after all, primates. We learn from each other. Social change still happens when people see their friends and their colleagues stepping out from the norm to find a better way, leading by example, having that conversation at the proverbial water cooler, coming out for animals. What does this mean for our own effectiveness? Well, it means we need to do even more than inspire others to change their diets and to stop participating in causing the harm. It means that we need to find ways to inspire others to go out there and inspire others, and others, and others. All right, now I'm going to turn to something very controversial, and I'm going to defend, do something, do anything. This is kind of the, the opposite of effective, of effective altruism, this idea where people find, as John was talking about, when you find out what's, what, what's going on with animals, when they find out about all this stuff, and they feel a need to do something, to do anything, just get out there. And of course, uh, I don't really mean to do something, do anything. And I don't really mean that we shouldn't think about what, what's effective. Um, maybe I mean more, do something, even if you're not sure what's the best thing to do. Uh, do something, do anything is, is, is touted by some as the opposite of effective altruism. And it, it, because effective altruism seeks to find the best way for people uh, to change the world. or or the, not necessarily the best way to make yourself feel better or enjoy yourself while doing good. That's not a harm, but it's not your main goal. And, or just to follow your intuition about what might work. And I'm afraid to use the word intuition in a room that contains Peter Singer, but I've just done it. Um, for people who are open to that message, it's great. But at our house, since we want to get every single person who cares about animals to work to change the world, every single person, we also try, for better or worse, to meet people where they are about what it is they feel moved to do to change the world. And people will in all sorts of different places about what works best. Our experience has been that you can't necessarily get them to do what you think is best. They won't. They just, they just don't do that. Have you noticed that? Even if you're really sure you're right, especially at this point in time when the research just isn't good enough to say for sure exactly what works best. And if one of the most exciting things that's happening is that research is getting so much, so much better. Another reason that we're enthusiastic about people with doing what appeals to them or makes sense to them is the importance of innovation. We are trying to change the way the entire world works when it comes to animals. None of us actually knows how to do that. It's a big lift. People who care about animals have different talents, they have different skill sets, they have different passions and convictions. Since none of us really knows for sure what works and since it's kind of a big job, Trying new things is really, really important at this juncture, in this moment. Then, of course, testing them with research is great. But at this point in time, it seems important to expand rather than contract our approaches to changing the world. A while back, uh, we um, started talking at our penthouse about doing a new video focusing on the connections between gay rights and animal rights. We believe that this was enough of a crossover issue to allow such a video to maybe catch some non-fire attention. And, you know, we're all going for non choir attention uh, whenever we can. So we wanted it to be very positive, gentle, and full of food. Uh, that was our choice based on our experience of running our hen house, feedback that we get from our listeners, on what we play well and what we do well. So in the process of planning, we ended up losing a grant because for the, for the fundamental reason that, that we, and I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not blaming this grant maker because this is what they do, but they, they hold, the research has shown that the thing that is most likely to get somebody to become a vegan is seeing footage of the suffering of animals on factory farms. If you show somebody footage, they're going to change. And we didn't want to put footage in. They wanted footage, so they didn't fund our video. 
We wanted, I mean, we wanted our video to actually turn people. <laughs> we wanted it to change hearts and minds. But we felt that what we do best is share personal stories and that footage didn't feel right. So the video turned out pretty well. I see two of the stars in, in, in the back. People in Michael. Um, it was, it was, it, the video turned out great, I think. And it, it's got a lot of tension from mainstream gay media. And a lot. That didn't used to be an expression, did it? <laughs> um, and a, it's gotten a lot of views, too. Um, it's gotten really a lot of views. It's one of the most successful things we've done. Would it have done as well if it had footage? I tend to think not. I mean, I, I don't think, I think it's hard to get into mainstream, even mainstream gay media, um, if you're going to show footage of factory farms. Um, but maybe, you know, I don't know. Uh, we might be wrong. Even if it didn't get as many views, maybe it would have been more effective in getting people who saw it to go vegan. Uh, would they have been more likely to stay vegan if they, if they saw footage? Uh, I don't pretend to have the answers here. I, I just, again, we're not convinced at all that there's any research really establishing how you do this. So we made the video we thought would be, we would be good at making, uh, that we thought people who aren't at all awakened to animals might be willing to watch, uh, and which had the best chance of changing their hearts and minds, for better or worse. Our fourth point is, how do we count this stuff? It's hugely helpful to be able to count how much change we are creating with our activism or with our dollars. The how many human lives are saved by mosquito nets sort of questions. And I know that lots of good work is going into coming up with ways to count this stuff. For example, studies are performed where leaflets are handed out and follow-up work is done to track behavior change from each of them. And new studies are, I'm sure, being designed as we speak. Because these studies are trying to measure behavior change, not just money donated, it seems like the measuring process has the potential to get really complicated. There are so many questions that could potentially be asked. Think about it, when it comes to that leaflet, how many people go vegan? Do they stay vegan? For how long? If they don't stay vegan, do they cut down on their animal foods? How much? How many people who are inspired by that booklet inspire others to become vegan? How many people don't go vegan as a result of that leaflet, but go vegan a year later when they see footage? Did reading the leaflets at the stage that eventually helped them get there? The fact is that measuring all the potential effects on a leaflet is tough. And when change-making efforts go beyond a leaflet, for which is relatively easy to measure outcomes, it's got to get so much harder. So many things that we do hoping to change the world for animals are subtle, they're difficult to measure, and they may not bear fruit right away. If we throw too many of these types of things away in exchange for absolutely measurable short-term progress, we may be starving out groups that are pursuing strategies that may actually be more effective. Many of them seek to create long-term systemic change. As one example, the arts. The arts, the media, which are frequently just put out there, to my knowledge, not always with effective ways to track who heard what, what conversations were started, how many tears were shed, etc. Okay, I'm going to insert, insert my first of two, maybe three Broadway references. <laughs> As anybody who listens to the Our Hen House podcast knows, I get most of my wisdom from Broadway, from show tunes. And we happened to be listening to South Pacific, the original cast recording with Mary Martin on vinyl. And we were listening to this while we were thinking of what to say today. And if you're familiar with that Rodgers and Hammerstein classic, you know that it's one of its major themes is racial prejudice, particularly regarding this, the issue of marriage between white people and Polynesians. Now, this song, You've Got to Be Carefully Taught, includes these words of wisdom, which I'm going to say, not sing. You're welcome. <laughs> You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly made, and people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, to hate all the people your relatives hate. You've got to be carefully taught. Now, it may seem very old hat, but at the time, this was a pretty controversial topic and a daring one to bring before audiences. So how much 
did this mega hit eventually made into a blockbuster movie influence the discussion around race in the United States? I have no idea. And I have no idea how you would count that. But my sense is that it was, in fact, a huge impact. Caveat. I'm not saying that just because some things are hard to measure that I think we should simply turn to intuition about what works better to reduce animal suffering. But I guess I am saying that maybe we should let intuition play a role in deciding what to try. And maybe then come up with ways to evaluate. Professor. Okay, lies, damn lies, and statistics. Or how do we evaluate accurately? We are strongly in favor. I mean, we really are. Uh, we're not here as naysayers. We're strongly in favor of research that tries to evaluate what is most effective. But we are very wary as well. As we like to point out on the Argument House podcast, the potential activities that individuals can engage in to help animals are almost limitless. Leafleting, grassroots pro protests, writing letters to the editor, filming documentaries, opening vegan restaurants, writing books, teaching animal law, illegal direct action, rescuing animals, opening sanctuaries, demanding vegan options, podcasting, baking vegan cupcakes, bringing them to the office, whatever. There's a much longer list than that. Do all of them work? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I mean, I can make my guesses, but I don't know. Can we measure them all? It just doesn't seem like we can measure all of those. But given how useful, measurement can be, and how important it is, under, very understandably, to funders who are spending their money to help people uh, do some of these activities. It seems possible that we might run the risk of being biased toward activities with outcomes that are relatively easy to measure. We decided to call that accountability bias because it makes it sound scientific. <laughs> That, but it really could be a problem. It could lead to the funding of research to prove that, that those techniques work and the discarding of other types of activism that are harder to measure. But research and statistics don't always give the full picture. Even in the areas where it's possible to decide studies and fund research that's going to show us effect effectiveness, maybe say the different leaflets with the different asks, uh, that, uh, you may link just did a, a survey um, uh, on this sort of thing, and it was a small, a small research project because they didn't get their million dollars yet. But, uh, but it was going for exactly the thing, issuing different leaflets, asking people to, for, for different asks. And if, you, if you're interested in this, uh, David Copenhagen, who's the um, executive director of UAB, was on our podcast last, last week uh, talking about it. That's at arhamhouse.org. Um, another thing that might be easy to measure is corporate outreach. You can measure out, outcomes. Online ads are, are easy. Um, even, uh, even in those cases where it's relatively easy, the research and the conclusions drawn from it are probably not good enough yet to necessarily rely upon in throwing other types of advocacy under the bus. And another problem with this sort of research is that it isn't always that easy to interpret. A while back, an animal rights organization started toying with advocating for people to go meat-free rather than advocating for the, them to go vegan or vegetarian. Uh, this was based on research showing that supermarkets had an easier time selling food labeled meat-free than food labeled vegan or vegetarian. Um, from my vantage point, just thinking about it, I'm not sure that this interpretation was correct. A person in a supermarket who is not vegetarian might be reluctant to buy food labeled vegetarian because he might think that food is just vegetarian. So he might buy meat-free because he's heard that he should cut down on meat. That's wholly different from, from the project of an animal rights organization trying to appeal to its supporters or to people who might be toying with the idea of, of, of going vegan. A person who is thinking about embracing an organization or a campaign or a role model might be more inspired by the word vegan than by the negative word meat free, even if they are not exactly ready to embrace being vegan themselves. To tell the truth, I actually have no idea whether my interpretation is right. I just don't have any other idea whether the other inter interpretation is right. Research, research can be dangerous, um, especially when you're applying uh, research meant in one field to another field, which is another reason why it's so great that so much money is being brought to bear, specifically on the questions confronting the animal rights movement. Um, before we think, do things like throw words like vegan and vegetarian away, though, uh, words that are pretty special to a lot of people in this movement, we should be sure that the research fully supports their alleged ineffectiveness. And that's why we did the video we wanted. Not because we didn't think research is helpful, but because it can't tell us enough and we weren't sure that the video, that the research was being cited, told us that that video wouldn't reach people. On the other hand, that's why the effective altruism movement is committed 
getting better and better research, and why some fun the funders are bringing these big bucks for there. Research is important, but it must be treated with care. Can we at least figure out what we want? No. Well, okay, we know what we want, or at least I do. Marianne does too. We want a world free of animal suffering, but that's a pretty big ask in a world where most of the people we're appealing to are actively participating in the harm we seek to prevent. So what is the most effective ask? What should we ask them to do that is most likely to result in them changing their behavior in a positive way? This is a huge question and one that I expect will be the subject of much research going forward, as well it should be. Do we ask people to go vegan, to reduce, to buy humane? What reduces suffering the most? What's the best way to convince people to go vegan? If footage is the best way to convince people to go vegan, how do we get people to watch footage? How do we know if people went vegan? If we convince people to go vegan, how do we get people to stay vegan? How do we know if they stay vegan? Is promoting veganism the best way to reduce suffering and death? or? Do you do more good by persuading people to cut back? Are they more likely to cut back if you ask them to cut back or if you ask them to go vegan? Given the enormity of suffering on factory farms, should you focus on persuading people to support reforms that reduce that suffering by eliminating the worst practices? If you achieve reforms, do you have more short-term success but undercut future success by making animal consumption seem more legitimate? As if it weren't difficult enough to figure out which is the most effective ask, I think we need to consider whether different messages and different types of advocacy work differently on different people, so you need more than one ask. We do, after all, want to reach everyone, and we don't want to all be doing the exact same thing. But that's not all. Perhaps even more importantly, from our point of view, is whether the message works for the speaker as well as the listener. As noted, we need everyone who cares about animals to speak up for them, on their own time, in their own community, and in their own way. While research about effectiveness clearly matters for some people, it may be pointless to expect them to advocate for something they don't believe in or advocate in a way that doesn't work for them. And we need those people because we need everyone. So even if research were to show, and I'm not saying it does or it doesn't, that it's more effective to ask people to reduce their animal consumption or support legislative reforms than it is to ask them to go vegan, can you expect people who passionately believe in the depths of their soul that veganism is a moral imperative to advocate for halfway measures? It's fine in that situation to advocate for reduction or reforms yourself or tell people why you do that and show them the research. But don't expect everyone to be able to advocate for something they don't believe in with their whole hearts. For people who, I gotta say, like us, believe with all of their hearts that we need to stop the horror that is happening every day to animals everywhere and that this is our life's mission for people who feel like they're one step away from maybe going crazy knowing what they know, who struggle with every fiber of their being to maintain some kind of hope to speak the truth as they see it is absolutely fundamentally necessary to maintain sanity because passion matters. Emotion matters. Honesty matters. All right, seven, community matters too. In case it's not clear, uh, we like to encourage people to go vegan. Um, <laughs> I like to clarify that we are, we're very open. Well, Jasmine didn't take out the berry. We're open to messaging. Uh, to uh, encourage people to at least take some steps toward veganism, support legislative reforms as well. Um, and we are open to it. We don't shy away from saying what we really think you should do is go vegan, but if you're not there, do, do uh, what, what you're ready to do, and then do some more. As we know, most people who become vegan or vegetarian then stop. That's a really big issue for this movement. So why that happens is one of the most crucial questions facing us. We can't prove it yet, but we believe that one thing that helps people stay on the side of animals is a sense of community. We'd love to see some research on this, but research is expensive, so in the meantime, we're following our intuition. 
but also the results of surveys that we do with our listeners, which is I think is kind of research. So maybe I'm talking specifically from my own experience here. Uh, I, this isn't widely known, so don't pass it on. But I first went vegetarian was when I was in my early 20s, and I didn't stick. I stuck for maybe a year. Two things that I know contributed to it not sticking were that I didn't know enough. I didn't educate myself about factory farming. I just thought it was wrong to kill animals. In my defense, animal liberation had not yet been published. <laughs> Otherwise, everything would have been different. <laughs> only Peter had done it a little bit. Um, I was also, officially, the only vegetarian I knew. Um, this was way before online community, so it wasn't that hard to, it wasn't that easy to find people. I am an introvert. Uh, I mostly hate people, so I'm not likely to have meetups. And most of the people who were vegetarian then were kind of totally crazy. Um, yeah, no, um, uh, so the conviction that community matters and the community can help people stay uh, true to their own principles is one of the, it's probably the main reason we found in our hen house. We know that there are a lot of people out there who are all alone with this. And I have two recent examples of this. Most of our listeners are in the U.S., but we do have listeners scattered around the world. And in one week, we received emails from listeners in Niue Island and Saskatchewan that told very similar stories. Uh, Niue Island is actually a country never heard of it before. It's actually a country in the South Pacific. South Pacific seems to be a theme in this talk. Um, and the person who wrote to us is vegan. She's the only vegan on the island um, in the country. And uh, the person from Saskatchewan lives in a small town in a rural area. Surprisingly, veganism is not rampant in a rural town. <laughs> um, and she's also the only vegan she, uh, that she knows. And, uh, and they told us that we were the only vegans that they felt like they knew. And having that connection, as tenuous it was, as it was, uh, as, as, as tenuous as a connection to a podcast is, uh, they felt really, really helped them. It gave them that sense of community. You don't need a lot, but you need something. Um, we're talking about people who, you know, whose families think they're crazy, whose friends make fun of them, who have nothing. So providing any kind of community is crucially important. That's one of the things that really needs to change. And just about almost wrapping up here, why, if we are so miserable and despairing, do we say we're indefatigably positive? Indefatigable positivity, that is our mantra and our strategy. We hope and believe that it, it, it is an effective one. When we say we're indefatigably positive, it doesn't mean we ignore bad news or that we don't want to kill ourselves at least once a day, but we try to dwell on the good news even when it's hard to find, and we do this because we think it keeps us and others sane and it keeps us working for the animals, and because it appeals to people, the people we're trying to reach. Now here comes my second Broadway reference. As Sally Bowles sang in the Immortal Cabaret, Everybody loves a winner. So, to make lyrical references, we try as hard as we can to accentuate the positive. And in addition to focusing on good news as part of our positivity strategy, we work really, really hard at not criticizing others who are working for animals, even if they're total assholes. <laughs> even if we think we know the way and everyone else is wrong, and believe me, we do and they are. We believe it is probably best to lead by example or by even better, by succeeding and being able to prove it than by criticizing others' tactics. For one thing, we all have to remember that people are, people are probably not doing harm just because they aren't following our advice. So let's take an example from Advocacy for Humans here. When you're dealing with advocacy to reduce human suffering, fighting schistosomiasis, a disease carried by worms that causes enormous harm in the developing world, may not be sexy, but arguably does the most good. So are people who are donating money to fight some rare genetic disease that only kills a few hundred people a year, therefore actually doing harm? No. They are perhaps not doing as much good with their money as they could if they donated it to combat schistosomiasis, but what they are doing is not immoral or wrong or evil. It would be kind of absurd to say it is. Sometimes, of course, it seems to us that other animal activists are doing things that are not only lost opportunities for doing it our better way, but they are actually harming the cause. We think that they're too loud, or they're too rude, or we think they're putting people off, or we think they're deceiving people by implying that they don't have to go vegan, or they're doing a million other things that might set us back. 
Now, in this instance, we take the position that even if we think others are setting us back, and it's really pretty hard to be sure of that, criticism is not going to change them, especially when it is so hard to conclusively establish what works. Nasty criticism or arrogant criticism is definitely not going to work. Anyone who has dealt with humans for any length of time knows it's actually probably more likely to get these people more firmly entrenched in their views. Really convincing research demonstrating success? That might work. And that's why we love the effective altruism movement. And we want it to get better and better and better. Which brings us to our final quick point that. I, I, I think everybody in this room knows it is all getting better. It is without question the most exciting moment in the AR movement in the 20 years I've been involved. Um, and the better it gets, the better it gets. Uh, with the passion that so many people are bringing to the cause, coupled with the fact that in their hearts, the vast majority of people in the world actually agree with us, actually agree that, that, that what's happening is wrong. They just haven't brought their behavior into accordance with their beliefs. The growth has the possibility of being exponential. It has the possibility of being explosive. We are so excited that the effect of altruism movement is, is bringing so many tools to bear to make this uh, happen even sooner and to change the world for animals. Thanks. which I think bear discussion, I'm glad you're making them. Um, and one of the things you're, you're saying is that it would be a bad thing if we determined that online vegetarian ads were the most effective thing, that we all pushed, went all in on that. And I totally agree. I think that there is a real danger in abandoning you know, some of the hard to measure things that are really good for advocacy. For example, uh, I went vegetarian 11 years ago, and I didn't know a single vegetarian or vegan, nobody, not a single one anywhere. I got it from a leaflet, uh, coincidentally, but uh, I, I went vegetarian, and uh, I tried to be the ethical vegetarian or whatever for a year, and then I learned more about it, and I went vegan, and then vegan sense, but when I was in that position, I was very, very lonely. I didn't know anybody else that had those mindsets, so even though I was an hour and a half west of Chicago, I made the trek to Chicago maybe every other month to go to a vegan meetup. Right? And then I was able to correspond with a bunch of other vegans, I was able to learn different recipes, I was learn, learning about different types of advocacy I didn't know about. So I think there's a lot of value in that, but how do you measure that, right? That's a really tough thing to measure. So I totally hear your argument there, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of value in conducting some research to get a better idea of what's most effective between the things that are being done. I don't think that there's any risk of us waving a magic wand and telling saying that, okay, we found that online ads help this many animals and leafleting helps this many animals, but you know, uh, corporate outreach does you know, no good or something like that, and then every group shifting their, their efforts to those. I think you know, we have a limited audience right now and that not everybody is gonna listen to what we have to say. And I think the same thing with our recommendation of farm animal advocacy. Uh, I don't, I'm not deluded to think that just because we recommend farm animal advocacy, there's not going to be tons of people who have you know, very passionate interests in other areas, and they're just going to completely give up those areas. I know they're still going to focus on those areas, and that's, that's good because we need to help all different types of animals. But I, just, I really do think there's a lot of value in producing research to help guide our decisions and to get us you know, thinking about these issues critically so that you know, regardless of what we're doing, we can try and do more effective things as opposed to less effective things in general, even if that's not uniform. That's, I guess, the one point I would make. But. Yeah, um, I, I think it was yeah, also, uh, I really enjoyed the presentation. And I, I think there are lots of interesting things there. And, and it isn't clear how much you're really disagreeing with us, right? Um, as you I don't said. I think we're disagreeing. Right. I would not dare disagree with you. 
Oh, you certainly should. That's, uh, we, we need to try out all sorts of, you know, otherwise things just become a dogma, as John Stuart Mill said. If you, if you don't disagree with things, they just become a dead wood, basically. But yeah. I all humor aside, I don't think we are really in significant disagreement. I think we just brought up different points. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And I certainly agree. I think we, we need to try out all sorts of different strategies. Um, and, but I do think it's really important to try to get some forms of assessing whether they work or not. I mean, you talked about, I think you said accountability bias, is that right? So uh, people do talk about measurability bias, uh, or sometimes, you know, uh, the bias for what's quantifiable. And that certainly is an issue. Um, if we look at the effective altruism in reducing global poverty. Uh, so uh, Jasmine mentioned the uh, Schistosomiasis Control Initiative. So it um, deals with one disease, it has a drug treatment for it, you can do very clear randomized controlled trials where you treat people in, you know, you have 100 villages, you randomly select 50 villages uh, to treat and 50 villages not to treat, you get baseline measurements in them all uh, and you can find out how well this works, how many lives it saves, how many cases of illness it saves. Uh, and there's a few other things like that, giving out uh, bed nets against malaria is pretty much like that. Um, and then there are these other things um, where people talk about, well, what about doing advocacy for the poor, for example? Um, so uh, Oxfam had uh, a pro project uh, a while ago when, when Ghana discovered oil. Um, there's been you know, various countries in sub-Saharan Africa that have discovered oil. Typically, the proceeds of the oil discovery have gone to um, benefit the already wealthy people in those countries and have done nothing for the poor. Um, if you read a column that Nicholas Kristof did about Angola a couple of months ago, it was a very clear case. So Oxfam decided to join with civil society groups in Ghana to try to make sure that some of that money went to help the poorest people. Uh, and for an investment of something like $100,000, they and the civil society groups ended up passing a law that, if I remember right, puts $115 million annually, I think, into uh, helping impoverished peasant agricultural producers. So, you know, that's a huge win, but you couldn't have predicted that win you know, beforehand. And of course, Oxfam has lots of other advocacy projects that have not succeeded. Um, and you can't do randomized trials for advocacy projects of that kind. So, um, I think effective altruists need to recognize that. Um, and so on the, the, there's an organization called The Life You Can Save that spun off one of my books uh, and if you go there to the life you can save that all, you'll see that we don't only recommend the strictly quantifiable kind of charities. We're a little bit broader than givewell.org, which is you know, more narrowly focused on that. Because we do think that some of these things are worth having a, having a punt at and, and so on. But, but I think you do need to have some kind of story as to how this is going to work how this is going to make a difference. And I, you know, I, I mean, I think you do in the stories you told with the, the video. But um, you know, when, when organizations don't have that, when they just say, you know, give money to us, we're going to do this, and then you say, you know, well, how is that going to make a difference? I, I remember, for example, being asked by somebody to sponsor her uh, doing some fundraising against the dog meat industry in Korea. And I said, so tell me how you're going to stop it. And they said, well, there are some people in Korea who are going to buy the dogs in the dog market and give them good homes. And I said, well, isn't that just going to lead to people wanting to produce more dogs because you're just increasing the market for the dogs that they're selling? And they said, yes, but you know, we think that you've got to help these dogs. I have to say, I, I, you know, I think I, I lost you know, some support, some, some potential friendly person because I just couldn't see that, right? I, I really needed to have some strategy as to how this was going to reduce the amount of suffering uh, and, and killing of dogs in Korea. Uh, so that's, you know, if, if you can tell a plausible story and you can say, look, it's a, we don't really know, we can't do the trial, but we think it might work, then I think that, that's a reasonable thing to do, but we ought to then try and build up that knowledge. Uh, John said in his presentation, you know, the, the track record of success of different kinds of things in this sort of field, so that we eventually learn more about which of these sort of, uh, I guess, high risk, high payoff ventures actually are worth it. Yeah, yeah I, I think we would totally agree with that. I mean, I think the 
fact that research is being done is uh, absolutely crucial, you know, as you said. One thing I guess I would add, it just occurred to me as you were talking, I think it's just a particular risk in this movement because there is so little charitable money going toward animals compared to other movements. So uh, I guess there is a fear among a lot of small organizations that they could be left behind so easily before the research actually proves that they're not doing anything useful. Um, so that's why, at least, why it's great that the money is being brought to bear on research and what works. And I totally agree with you that if people don't have a plausible, even have a plausible story about what they're doing is useful, uh, then we have to rethink. But I, I guess people are, people in the movement, um, small organizations, I think are justifiably um, nervous that there will be too much concentration um, because of of some of the methods of evaluation. And I guess that was what, that was just the additional point that we had to make that, that occurred to me as you were speaking. Um, I'm going to say one other thing about the meat free, by the way, I just uh, occurred to me. I'm not sure that it's a bad thing. I, I rather like the idea of promoting things as products as being meat free, because think of all the other things, you know, fat free, lead free, no, smoke free no, wait environment. A, wait a second, wait a second. We agree with that. You agree with that? Like, products as no, meat free. free. I am Jasmine, I'm meat free. I mean, that uh, was, we were talking about taking that same, that same yeah. mentality and applying it to a personal identification. Uh -huh. Rather okay. than vegan. I see. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 we, we just yeah, you, want, you want the positive. <laughs> Actually, you know, and, and vegans seem to be becoming so positive. You saw the New York Times article on vegan glam, right? Yeah, yeah. no, we should start bragging about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm going to applaud the question. Yeah. Um, please quietly raise your hands. I'm going to make a list and try to not forget anyone. Yeah. So, let's see your hand there. Hi, I'm Brian from the Reducing Foundation. I think one of the things in the discussion is about sort of marketability and target audience. And I've always wondered, having I'm sort of in the effective autism community, most of my best friends are in that community, and I still don't quite know who their main target audience is. So are they target is effective altruism targeted to the general audience, the general population of people? Is it targeted toward um, people already in the movement to help them think more uh, sort of strategically? Because I know when I talk to the average person about meat consumption, for example, they might not care about animal rights, but they care about losing weight, or they care about saving money. And I worry that the mainstream um, doesn't care that much about logic. They care more about emotions than other things. So is it possible that the most effective altruist thing you could do is to manipulate those emotions and not necessarily talk to those people about logic? Just a sort of broad question. Uh, uh, so I would speak with regard to ACE specifically, I would say that we are targeting people in the animal advocacy communi community who have an effective altruist mindset. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say we're necessarily trying to target, uh, like, to grow effective altruists specifically. Um, we're trying to get people to think critically in the animal advocacy movement about how they can be more effective with their time and money. And I think you're absolutely right. There's a lot of uh, a lot of organizations and a lot of uh, a lot of uh, people that think we should spend more of our resources on marketing and and trying to uh, promote the message versus spending more money on collecting more data because maybe we have a general idea of what we should be doing and that should be good enough for the general public. Um, however, I think it's still really important to get a better understanding of what we're doing, to spend more resources on research so that we can be more certain in the uh, messaging that we provide to people. Um, there's no doubt about it, in the animal advocacy community, people uh, donate with their heart, right? It's a very emotional based uh, platform. As com in comparison to other charitable causes, I think it's particularly um, notable in the animal advocacy movement. I wouldn't quite say that we want to manipulate people, as you <laughs> phrased it, uh, but I think there's absolutely value in the way that, in, in tailoring your messaging and your promotion in ways that um, evoke emotions that 
that help people get to the same ultimate goal, which our ultimate goal is to help as many animals as possible, right? And for certain audiences, that's going to be through facts and evidence. For other audiences, that's going to be through tugging on their heartstrings. Um, so I, I don't necessarily think that we need to focus on one approach versus the other. I think in general the effective altruism movement has grown incredibly quickly over the past couple years since it was the, the, the term was coined. So I think there's, they're doing a lot of things right, uh, but I, I definitely think there is uh, a bit of a stigma and a perception out there of uh, effective altruism in some ways as uh, maybe elitist, and we, we should be working to counter that perception. So, you know, I, I think it's not a, we shouldn't just take one approach, we should be mindful of all the variables and, and act accordingly. I don't know if that quite answered your question, feel free to follow up. Thank you. Uh, just as a side note, uh, that's a perfect example of what I mean by question. It's an actual question, it's in size, short, and decision, so if anyone raises a question later, that needs to be something on you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, mostly for John, based on uh, your, your sort of self-evaluation uh, of uh, ACE, but I bet everyone else can weigh in a little bit too. So um, it seems like there's an emphasis on effectiveness, and one way of thinking about it is sort of like re-dividing the pie in different ways. But from following the effective altruist movement, both online discussions and donors, it seems like it's bringing in, it seems to me, I don't know this for sure, but it seems like it's bringing in a lot of people who, um, who might not otherwise be involved. Um, there's a certain type of person who's really attracted to this kind of intellectual approach to giving. Um, and so I'm just curious if there's a way of evaluating how much this uh, redistribution of income is really um, redistrib uh, moving money that would have otherwise gone to a different place rather than bringing in new people who are just attracted to the idea of effective altruism and sort of putting in new money into these causes. And, and if, if there's enough of the latter, it seems like there might not really be this worry of taking away from other groups. It's more just the sort of infusion of money from a certain type of person who's interested in approaching in a certain way. Absolutely. So I touch on a couple things there. Uh, first, there was a survey done by Dot Impact, and uh, last year on effective altruists, it involved, I think it had somewhere around the neighborhood of 1,200 usable responses, and they found what Marianne mentioned, we mentioned in our blog post, which was that roughly uh, in that survey, 33% were vegetarian or vegan, but if you looked at where those people were donating, it was, uh, again, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, so I apologize if I'm off, but it was like 7 to 10% donate to animal advocacy groups, despite the fact that, uh, you know, there's this one-third of that population who cares enough about animals to adjust their diet, they don't, they're not convinced enough to donate financial resources to the cause. So I think there's a lot of value in convincing those people who you know, by and large, are often in positions where they earn to give, so they're in high-paying careers, so they can donate a lot of money to effective animal causes. I think there's a lot of value in uh, showing them what is effective through rigorous research and what isn't effective. Uh, we actually did our first survey of donors that um, were influenced by our donation, the half million that I just mentioned, and. We didn't have a, a tremendous response because there's not that many people yet, but we had 35-ish uh, responses or something like that. And we asked questions like, "Are you, where would you have donated if you didn't donate to ACE? Or, excuse me, to one of our top recommended charities. Would you have donated to another animal advocacy group? Would you have donated to another uh, animal or another non-animal cause? Or would you just not have donated at all?" Uh, right now, I would say we don't have enough data to feel confident about some of the responses, and of course, uh, it's hard to tell where you would have donated if you didn't donate. You know, it's, it's like one of those uh, hypotheticals that people, it's hard to get the person to you know, accurately know what they would have done, but that's an area we're very concerned with, and we're trying to measure it, and we'll continue to in the future. So that's, that's a really good point. I don't have a great answer for where we're moving it from right now. But it is something we've attempted to measure this year and will continue to as we grow.
Thanks so much uh, to all of you. I, I want to build off a couple of themes that I heard in the Art Penthouse uh, presentation around this idea of sort of preaching to the choir versus extending uh, who's part of this conversation. And, and I want to ask specifically about racial and ethnic diversity uh, within animal rights generally and within effective altruism specifically. So, you know, as many folks involved in animal rights organizing probably know, it's predominantly white folks, white privileged folks, who tend to be involved in the mainstream organizations. I've looked into this in, in research in a, in a number of ways. I've collaborated uh, with a number of African American organizations and other, other groups in lower income communities, uh, communities of color. It's not that there are not vegetarians in those communities, but they tend not to engage with the kind of mainstream animal rights organizations. And, and I could give more detail on that, but I'm not going to do that. So my question, though, to, to be kind of concise is, do you believe that increasing cultural racial diversity in the major organizations uh, will make them more effective in terms of both leadership and in terms of outreach to the broader community at large. So is racial and ethnic diversity uh, you know, important for effectiveness? And if we don't think that, uh, is it important in terms of a more value-driven kind of concern that Professor Singer points to uh, in his earlier comments that uh, things like justice, things like diversity. So the question is how much should something like cultural racial diversity matter for effective altruism for animals? Okay. I mean, I, I'm perfectly willing to talk to it, though I don't think it's really uh, my place to talk about effective, the, what's going on in the effective altruism movement, so maybe John can join in. But, I mean, I, obviously, cultural and racial diversity is central to any change. I mean, if merely because of the fact that we need everybody to get on board. As you point out, a lot of people um, are parts of, of animal advocacy in a way that is not part of mainstream animal rights organizations. It is certainly not a, a white movement. Um, but a lot of organizations are, are very white. I don't, would they be more effective if, if they were more culturally and racially diverse? I mean, I'm, maybe I'm just bringing my own, I, I'm not bringing research to bear here, which is the central uh, feature of effective altruism, and others can speak to that. I don't understand how anything in our society, which is a culturally and racially diverse society, cannot be made more effective by, by also being culturally and racially diverse. It just seems obvious to me, but um, again, that's my intuition speaking. Uh, so I think it should be an important goal, whether the, whether the research carries that out, you know, it's for others, it's, it's for the research to still wait. I do think it's so important to make clear, though, the point that I started out with, that the, the fact that, as you call it, the mainstream animal rights movement is, is predominantly white, and certainly not exclusively white, and uh, but predominantly white is brought up a lot. It does not mean that there aren't people passionate and committed to this issue in every community, in this country and in this world. We are everywhere. We may do it in different ways and with different groups of people, but we are everywhere. I would just say I think I agree completely. I mean, I think diversity is extremely important and I think we could do better. And I'm not sure uh, where our, how we've gotten to the point we've gotten to. Uh, but I think it's something we should be thinking about. And this, this is where uh, I think this is a point that uh, Marianne and Jasmine would probably make, and I think they have a valid point, which is that if we were to determine, for example, that online ads were you know, a lot, whatever, 50% more effective if we targeted young females, does that mean we should be exclusively targeting young females? I mean, this is already a movement that is, consists of primarily a female audience, and are we further alienating men by not investing some money in reaching out to those individuals as well, and I think we are. And I think um, I think there are some advocacy materials that, uh, and I'm speaking to gender here, I guess, more than diversity, but the same principle. I think there are some materials that cater too strongly to certain audiences just because research indicates something. And I think you know, there's there's value to expanding your reach and not not over narrowing. Uh, based on, on some findings like that. So I, I absolutely think it's, a, it's an issue and something we should address. I don't, I don't have the greatest ideas on how to do it right now, apart from not just a blindly following what research says, you know, X um, audience is, is the most effective and throw all your cards in that basket. I don't think we should ever do that. 
Um, but I'm, we're always receptive to, to feedback on that. Um, I, I don't think I have a lot to add to what's already been said, which I largely agree with. Um, in terms of uh, the movement um, being more female, I, I think um, it's true in terms of membership of organizations, right? I, when I looked at statistics a few years ago, I asked a few large groups that their memberships or supported bases were something like 75 to 80 percent female. But of course, the leadership was not 75 to 80 percent female. Um, and, you know, that's always an, an issue um, that, uh, you know, men and probably uh, whites in particular will, are, are more likely to end up um, in those leadership roles. So that's something we have to be aware of, I think. And, um, uh, you know, hopefully movements, hopefully that will, will change and uh, we will also have more diversity. Um, so we have Brad, um, Jan, and then my, my uh, request oh, oh. <laughs> to be you. I'll just speak by the house there. You know, uh, my question really, uh, well, I'm going to be saying this question, sorry. Uh, kind of uh, follows on uh, the last comment that Marianne made, almost a throwaway comment, that uh, this movement is becoming uh, much more centralized in a few uh, organizations, a few, a few uh, nonprofits that are probably able to show demonstrative uh, kind of uh, effectiveness. And what I fear is that too much attention on uh, on the, uh, this effectiveness quotient is going to uh, turn away kind of creative investment in, uh, in organizations and in activities that who knows where it could lead in the future. Uh, you know, if you, got, if you got every philanthropist just looking at what's been done to make organizations effective in the past, how do you measure, you know, what the potential effectiveness of academic programs in animal rights are, or um, uh, uh, funding uh, funding a kind of um, sponsoring research programs, um, or for that matter, uh, just going with your gut and identifying exceptional people that want to do certain projects. And, uh, you know, to kind of taking the position that, well, I know it's a, a, a big risk, but who knows, maybe one of those projects could turn out to be game-changing for the movement. So, I, th I think to take it too far really can, can put a dampener on uh, what I would call creative investment and willing to maybe take a risk. And, and Peter, I guess this is getting around to the question, I'd just be curious to your answer. Do you think that uh, Henry Sparer and Animal Rights International would have been funded uh, originally? <laughs> by, with, because, and I say that because Henry Sparer, second to uh, Peter, is probably the most influential uh, you know, figure in the animal rights movement uh, in its history. Um, um, well, um, probably, you know, at, at that stage, uh, he might not have been, but uh, one of the interesting things about Henry is that he was aware from the beginning that what was going on at the time was not effective. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Henry Spiro was somebody who came out of a, a lot of other movements, the civil rights movement, uh, union reform movements, uh, and so on, uh, and actually came to a class that I taught here at NYU, an adult continuing education class in 1973-74. Um, when I was writing Animal Liberation, and I was basically, the, the, what I was talking about was really draft chapters of the book. And at the end of the class, which unfortunately had nothing like the number of people in this room, I probably, <laughs> probably had, I don't know, 15, 20 people in the room. At the end of the class, uh, Henry, who, who had, you know, had, had worked on, as a merchant seaman, has worked on the Ford assembly line and had an accent that I won't try to imitate, but it was definitely uh, a, a rather rough one, sort of stood up and said, well, we've had a lot of theory and talk about philosophy and animal rights and all that, but 
who would like to join me in doing something about this? Um, and, uh, you know, half a dozen hands went up and he said, okay, so let's meet in my apartment and he gave his address and we'll talk about what we can do. Um, and that's where, uh, really, I think the first campaign that successfully stopped a set of animal experiments on animals uh, got going. Uh, experiments on cats at the Museum of Natural History, which were pretty horrible and also you know, really pointless experiments. Um, so in a way, he didn't really need funding at that stage. I mean, he, he got funding then from a couple of other people when he wanted to run an ad, for example. He went to a couple of people who were wealthy and who supported him. Um, but he did have a clear strategy. He said, here's a campaign. Um, oh, and the bit I left out is, what he said was, what, what groups have been doing up to now, I could remember his description. Um, he was talk, talking about the anti section groups. Is, Each month, they will mail you a leaflet with pictures of animal suffering and experiments that will make you feel really awful. And then they will say, give us money so that next month we can mail you more pictures of animals and experiments that will make you feel really awful. Um, and, and essentially what he was saying, there was no strategy here about how mailing you these brochures is going to change animals, you know, the number of animals being experimented on. And he did have an idea about, you know, he said that the movement needs a win. Um, so to get a win, we need to choose a good target. And he found this target using FOI, you know, in fact, coincidentally, amazingly, within about five blocks of where he lived, where the was on the Upper West Side, found this target, ridiculous experiments, causing pain, said, look, we can make an impact and then we'll have a win. And once the movement has established some credibility that it can actually change things, then we'll get more people coming in. So you're right that, you know, maybe initially it would have been a long shot, but um, it was clearly a potential strategy that was worth doing. And, and I think, uh, as I was saying, I think effective altruism can support that, and I think it can support some of the other initiatives that you mentioned in setting up uh, research programs. I know John would certainly like to be able to do more research into what works, um, setting up academic programs that can, you know, get the power of, uh, academic teaching and uh, uh, interest people in academia where there are a lot of resources that are not always being used uh, for any particular desirable purpose, uh, get them directed towards, uh, are we online here? I'm just um, so yeah, I think, I think there, are, there are many things where you can see where this is worth, uh, worth, worth taking a risk with, definitely. I just want to add one thing. Uh, which is that, as I mentioned, our Hen House is a media organization, we're a nonprofit, and we're not on the list of 100 animal charities. Um, and I think we do very important work. So um, I, I just wanted to add to what Brad was saying, which is that uh, you can't always measure the value of the media or of the arts. I also, speaking of the 100 charities, I know that. Um, People who are on that list of, of animal charity evaluators, uh, list of animal charities, who aren't the recommended ones, feel a little bad about that. Um, I, it's as if they're not recommended. So they're, no matter what you do, they're, especially when you're in the business you're in, there are always risks. Certainly. Uh, so I've got a couple, couple things to talk about there. Uh, I'll address the latest points first. Uh, we do have a list of 155 organizations we've looked at, we've considered for our recommendations. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of charities in the world, so if your charity's not on the list, that you're not alone. Um, we, we're definitely mindful of that concern. In fact, that was part of the critique I mentioned in my talk that people had, had brought to us recently that they, feel, they felt like maybe those, so we have three top recommended charities and four standout charities right now. They felt maybe those other 148 charities, people are seeing them as getting an F. And to me, that was really surprising. And it's very helpful to have that feedback because to us, if anything, and I'm not saying we do this, but if anything, it would seem to me that if you have seven charities which are doing really, really good work, and then you have 148, like clearly we don't think 148 Charities are terrible. Um, at the very least, you would think like, okay, these guys are getting B's and C's, and the one who's doing the very top tier are getting the A's, right? So that was surprising, and it's helpful for us to know that, and we're going to improve our messaging in that regard. We've added uh, some uh, verbiage to our page where we list our charities, where we mention 
um, that there are some excellent charities that for one reason or another didn't get a recommendation. Um, we're going to improve our messaging and our printed materials in the future where we list organizations and things like that. Again, this is where critique to us is super valuable and super helpful. So I definitely appreciate that, but um, it's not our intention to, to put any of those organizations down because there are plenty of those groups that are doing really great work. Um, with regard to the original question, I would say I, I completely agree with that. I think that's one of the reasons we so heavily weigh our fourth criteria of that the organization has shown that they've learned from failures. That means that they're trying things, they're trying different things, and if they're not trying different things, then they're not failing, then they're not learning, and there's no innovation. So that would also tie into your question about diversity. I think bringing more diversity in would be really good because you probably bring in new ways of thinking, right? That we're not doing right now, and so that would be very valuable to the movement. So I, I completely agree that that having some innovation in that respect is is valuable, and that's one of the reasons we weigh that criteria very heavily. Um, yeah, I think that's it. We have two questions on the queue. We're running out of time, so two questions are short. You can't see that. All right. So, um, so I'm Yannick yeah, Kovic. I'm from the New School of Politics. I have a question for uh, for John. It's like a question and two self questions on provocation, but I'll try to make it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so my question is quite simple, right? Sure. How do you quantify suffering and the reduction thereof? And how do you measure organizational effectiveness based on this quantification? Right, so I have two sub-questions. Mm -hmm. The first one being, is this about reducing suffering of animals, or is it about reducing the killing of animals and the conditions under which they are raised? I mean, the broader question of this movement, right? The second one is, is this about helping animals, or is this about harming those who harm animals? And so I have an example, right? So this big victory being counted by Anfei, HSUS, et cetera, is convincing you know Smithfield to go from gestation crates to group pens in pork housing, right? Is this a reduction of suffering, and does this actually move the movement forward, right? Group pens are still factory farming, right? The marginal switching cost, so the harm caused to Smithfield is is minuscule, it's literally marginal, and on top of this, Smithfield, Starbucks, Nestle can now all claim humane treatment and cooperation with the animal rights the animal rights movement. Right? So in that case, has there actually been a large step forward or a sustainable step forward taken in actually helping animals? Right? Like is that still a victory? And by your metrics, would that be a reduction of suffering, especially in the long term? So I think it's very hard to quantify the reduction of suffering there. Uh, I certainly think there is a reduction of suffering. I think that you make some very valuable points. I think it's very uh, important to be careful in your messaging to not um, you know, completely disregard the fact that these animals are still being used for food. And I think, in the mo for the most part, a Mercy for Animals or an HSUS that wins a victory in this campaign, they'll always end those uh, victory emails and things like that with, a call to go vegan or, or information on how you can avoid all animal products with your diet. Um, I think you know maybe that's different for certain audiences and, and, and you know that, that goes with messaging overall. Um, so I think reduction of suffering is very important to us. That's a, a basis for a lot of what we do. Um, and I think that you, you're, you're certainly right that those animals are still suffering. But I think one of the biggest values in that victory is that you're getting the discussion into the public sphere. So whereas we were not talking about pigs and gestation crates, now we are talking about pigs and gestation crates. And maybe some incremental improvements in the grand scheme of things is not a gigantic reduction in suffering, but I think it's getting people talking about like, oh, so how are our food animals raised? And I can't tell you how many discussions I've had and, and how palpable the issue is to certain audiences who would not be receptive to a conversation about veganism or animal abuse and things like that. There was a HSUS video where they went out on the streets with a life-size gestation crate and they had people step inside the gestation crate for just, I don't know, if it was two minutes or something like that and you know, had the people experience what it was like to not have any freedom of movement and things like that. And, you know, okay, that's kind of gimmicky, but at the end of the day, they got a million views in a couple days on that video and that's a million people that are thinking about, wow, how are my food animals treated? So while the direct gains might not be what we all want, I do think it's a step in the right step direction. Okay, 
I mean, mine is more like a comment. Um, my name is Katya, and um, I work on evaluation, um, and often on evaluation about advocacy. And I just wanted to make a couple of points that might be helpful um, thinking about these issues. One is that the goal of good evaluation, the goal of good evaluation is to improve a program, not to judge necessarily one program against another. So that any uh, organization that's working on advocacy should welcome evaluation because it brings an external eye towards uh, improving the work that they're doing. And the second point is that a, a goal of good evaluation is to identify innovation, to identify innovation. Um, and so it doesn't have to be this kind of um, divisive experience whereby some uh, strategies are deemed effective and some are deemed less effective. Um, and uh, one point is we really need to define effectiveness because I, I don't, uh, from having listened for two hours, I'm not, I'm not really sure how people are defining effectiveness. And that's another thing that really has to be done in the course of an evaluation. Um, and then my final point is, I think that there's quite a lot that can be learned from advocacy in, for humans um, when working with animals, even though I really take what Marion and Jasmine said, that it's, it's, animals are different, animals are different. Still, when you think about evaluating groups of humans that are discriminated, discriminated against or that are criminalized, and those are the groups with, with whom I, I tend to work, um, when you work with those groups, those, the kinds of strategies, advocacy strategies that have been used could be quite usefully applied, I think, to the animal rights movement. And one small point, there are actually measures for, um, um, there are ways to measure the impact of media on, the, on behavior change, and um, I'm happy to uh, send them to you. Thank you. Thanks for the comments. Uh, I think there's a lot of value in what you were saying, and that, uh, yeah, there is a, a Kansas State study that we use, uh, that we say frequently for the effective media on meat consumption. The metric we generally use is the number of animals that are spared from a lifetime in a factory farm. And we get to that number by using um, these limited numbers of studies that we do have, which admittedly we have uncertainties about. They could be better. But uh, what we can use, what we do right now is we take the number of animals that are spared by a person's commitment to go vegetarian or vegan after receiving either an online ad or a leaflet, and then we factor in what economists call elasticity, cumulative elasticity factor. Now this is beyond uh, my calculations. This is something that I have wonderful research staff that calculate for me. But what we do is we use a 0.3 cumulative elasticity factor to adjust for the fact that reduction in demand does not immediately equal reduction in supply to, to quantify our, our numbers. Um, the first part, oh, and one last thing I wanted to put out there is, is I also agree with you. Uh, one thing that, that we are doing in November is we're making that an advocacy advice month. Uh, we'll come up with a better name for it later. But uh, essentially what we're going to do is we're going to focus the entire month on putting, we're going to double our blog production and every blog is going to be about how all animal advocacy groups can do better from things to how they can get Google grants to an interview with a development director to how they can fundraise better and uh, how they can improve their programs on a, on a large scale. So I completely agree that it's important that we are trying to help all groups, not just the, the most effective. I just wanted to add, and John, you probably know this better than I, but I know that the people who were recipients of that $1 million grant were actually seeking suggestions for research ideas. And it sounds like you have a number of them that might be very useful that are a little outside the box of what they're looking at now. Uh, I don't know whether they're still seeking those ideas, but I'd love to see your contributions in there. And let me just say that uh, although there are many issues with uh, evaluation and effectiveness, and I think the things you brought up are valuable, you have to put this against the background where most of the money that is donated to charities in the United States, and I think it's like $335 billion, of which about $250 billion comes from individuals, most of that money is based on no research at all. I saw a study which says that 70% of people who donate to charity do zero research. And the other 30% mostly do extremely superficial research, which might look at the amount of money that goes towards administration and fundraising. But that's a very poor guide to how effective an organization is because you, know, you can cut those expenses at the cost of then not knowing whether the programs you're putting your money into are really working at all or not. So um, 
if we just get some discussion and debate about how people really should be looking at evaluation or effectiveness in some way, even if we haven't really refined this to the kind of levels of precision that we would like to, I think we're still going to be doing good. Thank you. Let's give a final round of applause. some fresh air. Uh, just a few words. I would like to thank all my colleagues at the Amazonese Initiative and the Environmental Studies Department for supporting this event from the start. I would like to thank Celia Sansbury, who might still be in the room. She's here for welcoming most of you tonight. Uh, Natalie Garcia, our department administrator uh, and assistant, who uh, was a huge support for organizing all of this. Um, thanks for coming, all of you tonight and thanks to our speakers, obviously. Um, our next event is on October 29th, Why Politics Matter to Animals, with Congressman from Oregon, Earl Blumenauer. So you're welcome. Visit our website, animalstudies.as.nyu.edu, animalstudies.as.nyu.edu. And uh, also, Jay Schuster asked me to uh, talk about effective altruism NYC. So there's now a group of effective altruists in New York City. So effectivealtruism.nyc. This is the group if you're interested in joining the community. And I think that's it. Have a good night, everyone, and see you next time.